off this countdown, we have the spies. Tons of people are afraid that the government is spying on them. It's thought that they can tap into our phones and watch us and listen to our calls, even though I don't know why they would want to. Like, what are they gonna see me scrolling through like Instagram all day? It's not a pretty sight. Now, we can't really prove that they do, but recently a post on Reddit revealed that they are tracking us. So I don't know if this is a thing outside of Canada, but it is in Canada. So Apple and Android phones now have a COVID-19 sensor on them. Basically, this allows the government to track your every move. A couple of weeks ago, a lot of cell phone users were having phone disruptions, and that's apparently when the tracker was put on the phones in secret. But it's not on all phones. Once you update your phone, then it's automatically turned on. Don't believe me? Well, the post says that for iPhone users, go to settings, privacy, health, and then you'll see it, but it's not yet functional. For Android users, go to settings, then Google settings, and it should be there. This is said to be able to notify you if you've been near someone that has the virus. But it's also a way for the government to track your every move. Seriously, why would they have this feature and then just like not tell us about it? Why is everything done in secrecy? They're up to something. In our number nine spot today, we have mobilization. The Russo-Japanese war is one that lasted for a little over a year, spanning from 1904 to 1905. While the war was mainly between Russia and Japan, the signal interception I want to talk about today came from a British ship. As the Russian fleet was preparing for conflict with Japan in 1904, a British ship called the HMS Diana was stationed in the the Suez Canal. This canal is located in Egypt and it connects the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea. While stationed here, the HMS Diana ended up intercepting Russian naval wireless signals that were being sent out. These signals were apparently intended to signal for the mobilization of the fleet. In our number eight spot today, we have the BBC. So for this one, we have to be on the same page for what a numbers station is. Basically, they're short wave radio stations and the transmissions or broadcasts are usually certain numbers or other repetitive things which are believed to be aimed to address intelligence officers who are operating in foreign countries. So for this one, we are taking it back to 1983 when the BBC, yes, the British Broadcasting Corporation, received a letter from a listener they had in Andorra. This listener had written into the World Service Waveguide program to complain that during her attempt at listening, she was interrupted by a female voice that was reading out numbers in English, and she wanted to know what this interference was. While the corporation gave a regular non-sinister answer to the confused woman, after more research was done into the case, people aren't quite convinced. Many people who know much more about these things and recognize the patterns seen in number stations are fairly certain that this interruption was a numbers station that was being broadcast on a random frequency that just happened to intercept with this woman's BBC program. In our number seven spot today, we have the Duga radar. So for this one, we are talking about a huge missile defense radio structure called Duga 3. This structure is suspected of having been wildly over budget, and it was the source of many, many complaints after it was built. The systems were extremely powerful and broadcast in short wave radio bands. They would appear without warning and sounded like a sharp, repetitive tapping noise, and they would disrupt things like legitimate broadcasts, amateur radio, commercial aviation communications, and utility transmissions, which all led to there being international complaints. And at the time, people didn't know what it was. This led people to think that this signal was actually being used for things such as Soviet mind control or weather control experiments. In our number six spot today, we have World War I. For this one, we are taking it back to the first world war and discussing something that really changed the way we use wireless communications. Basically, during the first world war, British forces were able to intercept German radio communications. With this newfound ability, they were able to learn about the plans that German forces had and used this to their advantage. Of course, later when this was found out, no one wanted a similar thing to happen to them, but the technology was so valuable they couldn't just give up on it. This is said to be what led to the use of cryptography, which was intended to conceal the messages being sent out, and thus cryptoanalysis, which originated to get around this new extra layer of protection, was born. In our number five spot today, we have Cobra Mist. This is the code name that was used to describe the experimental over the horizon radar that ended up being stationed at Orford Ness, England. 
It was originally supposed to be stationed in Turkey where it could cover most of the European Soviet airspace, but Turkey had some objections and weren't all that pleased with the idea. This led to the site being moved to the UK where it offers a view of most of Eastern Europe. The system was built through the 1960s and into the 1970s, so you think it would have been this amazing success, but things went more than a little awry when it was first turned on. When switched on, it began having these noise problems, and despite best efforts, no one could figure out where these problems were coming from, which led to the project being shut down in 1973. In our number 4 spot today, we have UVB 76. This sound apparently began to happen in the 1980s when a radio tower just north of Moscow began transmitting a random and seemingly bizarre assortment of beeps, but in 1992, the sound began to change. In that year, it suddenly switched to a buzzing sort of sound that would last about a second, and the sound would occur somewhere between 21 to 34 times every minute. This strange routine would be interrupted once every few weeks by a male voice which would then be reciting a string of numbers and words, mostly Russian sounding names like Anna and Nikolai. The buzzing wasn't necessarily always exactly the same, as the tone would switch and there would be different intervals between the buzzes, but one thing that was always consistent is that every hour on the hour, the station would have two quick consecutive buzzes. To make things stranger, in June of 2010 and also in August of that year, the station briefly stopped sending out signals, despite it having been constantly for years and years. At the end of August in 2010, the station again changed and there began to be different shuffling sounds and thuds that could be heard in the background, and often little snippets of the dance of the little swans from Swan Lake would also interrupt the broadcast. While we obviously know that these sounds are coming from a radio broadcast and we can make out what some of the sounds we're hearing are, we have absolutely no idea what purpose they serve, where they are coming from, or what they might mean. Right now the best guess is that these are secret messages that are being transmitted to secret agents. If that is the case, it's likely we might never know exactly what is being discussed in these broadcasts. In our number 3 spot today we have the Lincolnshire Poacher. The Lincolnshire Poacher, which is a British numbers station, was being transmitted from Cyprus. It began transmitting in the middle of the 1960s and was in operation until quite recently in 2008. This station is believed to have been operated by the British Secret Intelligence Service, and the reason behind its name is because it is said that the station commonly used bars from the English folk song of the same name. There would often be a female voice heard reciting a group of five numbers with the final number in the group being read in a higher pitched voice. It is believed that the station was meant to be communicating with undercover agents operating in the Middle East. Back in 2006, however, this broadcasting was interrupted by the North Korean Foreign Language Service, Voice of Korea. This language service began to broadcast on the same frequency as the Lincolnshire Poacher, which some believe may have been intentional. In our number 2 spot today, we have Anna Montez. For this one, we are taking a bit of a turn and talking about someone who used secret signals in transmissions in order to spy on the US for Cuba. Anna Montez is a former American senior analyst at the Defense Intelligence Agency, and for 17 years she used encrypted messages to receive information and communicate with the Cuban government in order to spy on the United States. In the charging documents, American federal prosecutors said, quote, Montez communicated with the Cuban intelligence service through encrypted messages and received her instructions through shortwave encrypted transmissions from Cuba. In addition, Montez communicated by coded numeric pager messages with the Cuban intelligence service by public telephones located in the District of Columbia and Maryland. The codes included, I received message or danger. Anna was arrested by the FBI at her office on September 21st, 2001, and part of the reason why is because she apparently had classified information on the US military's pending invasion of Afghanistan, and people were worried that she might go on to further reveal this information. While Anna pleaded guilty to her crimes, which could have carried a death sentence, she received 25 years and her tentative release date is January 8th, 2023. In our number one spot today, we have Atencion. This is a number station that ended up being the first to be officially and publicly accused of transmitting messages to spies. This station was the center of an espionage trial, and US prosecutors claimed that the station was sending numbered codes for the accused to write down using Sony handheld shortwave receivers and then decode using a computer program. This gave them their next instructions that were to be followed in their spying plans. During this trial, 
while the FBI testified that they had entered one of the spies' apartments and copied the decryption code that was used for the messages sent from the station. Using this code, they were able to unveil the secret messages being sent out, which they read in court. Starting off this countdown, we have the prisoners. In 1902, American doctors stationed in the Philippines decided to do some experiments on their own. First, they withheld proper nutrition from 29 of their prisoners. They did so in order to induce beriberi, which is a disease caused by lack of vitamin B1. Lack of vitamin B1 can cause difficulty walking, loss of feelings in the hands and feet, and loss of muscle function. It can cause irreversible damage to your nervous system and heart. And they forced these prisoners into this. Four of the test subjects died as a result. Then later that year, another physician decided to inject five prisoners with the bubonic plague. The prisoners had no clue about this and they became very sick. Then four years later in 1906, Dr. Richard P. Strong infected more prisoners with cholera. All subjects became sick and 13 of them sadly died. Most of the tests were done to see what disease they should use in case of biological warfare. Moving on to number 9, we have Nixon's health. Now this isn't really classified information, but I thought it was quite interesting and it was brought to my attention by Kelly Kama Roy on Reddit. So the files of Richard Nixon's longtime physician Dr. Walter Tkach, probably said that last name wrong, are on lockdown. The doctor's son has the files and is planning to eventually release them to the Nixon lab. Library, but when he does, they will not be open for 75 years. Not only that, but taped conversations between Nixon and his doctor are also on lockdown and they will not be released. Now, why is this significant? Well, some people believe that Nixon was incapacitated towards the end of his presidency. If so, then under the 25th Amendment, he should have had his authority suspended. So, there's a reason why the government has been keeping these files classified. It's going to apparently expose a lot. In our 8th spot, we have the trade documents. Back in 2019, the Reddit account OsterMaxNN leaked a bunch of UK government trade documents. The documents discussed future trade deals between the US and the UK. They also revealed plans by the Conservative Party to privatize National Health Service. After investigation, it turns out that the Reddit user that leaked the documents was part of a larger coordinated effort from Russia. Reddit said, and I quote, we investigated this account and the accounts connected to it. And today we believe this was part of a campaign that has been reported as originating from Russia. In our 7th spot we have Area 51. Everyone wants to know what really goes on in Area 51. Is it really where they are keeping aliens? I need to know. But sadly, we don't truly know. But we do have some insider information on what it's like in Area 51. Yeah, you heard me. Eight years ago, a Reddit user by the name of Kiver16 revealed that his mother's boyfriend is Steven Gorvan, aka one of the people who was at Area 51 testing the Mars rover. He uploaded a picture of Steven holding a sign saying, Hi Reddit, ask me anything, as proof that it actually was him and he wasn't just going to make it up. So people quickly jumped to it, asking him tons of questions on the mysterious base. During one part of the Q&A, Steven revealed that when he first arrived at the base, he saw a strange aircraft flying low across the desert floor. He believed that it was a test flight for a secret aircraft. He said it moved at subsonic speed and didn't make a lot of noise. He also revealed that Area 51 is much bigger than it looks, with tons of different sectors and buildings. Now, sadly, he didn't see any aliens. But he did reveal that it seemed like we are close to hoverboard technology, like the ones you see in Back to the Future. So that's pretty cool. Moving on to number six, we have DB Cooper, one of the most famous and mysterious cases of all times. And I might have found out what happened to him. But first, let me give a rundown on this dude for the people who have no clue what I'm talking about. Dan Cooper, or DB Cooper, is a man who was responsible for a plane hijacking in 1971. No one knows who he is or where he is now. So in 1971, Cooper boarded the plane and once in the air, he handed the flight attendant a note saying that he had a bomb in his suitcase. He demanded $200,000 and a parachute. 
but he didn't want any hostages. So they landed in Seattle, he got his request, and then he told the pilot to fly to Mexico City. However, along the way, he took the money and his parachute and jumped out of the plane. The police looked for Cooper until 2016, and this case is known as one of the longest active searches in history. Now, Two years ago, a former FBI special agent joined Reddit and did a AMA, ask me anything. To prove it was really him, he held a piece of paper like the other dude, saying his name and his Reddit, blah blah blah. The man is Mark Ruskin, who worked 20 years in undercover operations. One of the questions that someone asked him was about D.B. Cooper, and what the FBI thought happened to him, and what he thought happened to him. Ready for this? Both the FBI and Mark believe that D.B. Cooper did not survive the parachute down. I know, I know, so anticlimactic, but apparently they have evidence to suggest he didn't make it. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the cat bomb. So this secret isn't really a secret anymore, I guess most of these aren't secrets anymore, but I didn't know this was a thing until I read about it on Reddit, meaning that I bet some of you haven't heard about it either. So during World War II, the government thought it would be a good idea to strap a cat to a bomb. They thought that by doing so, it would assure the bombs would reach their target. Cats hate water, so they thought if you drop a cat strapped to a bomb over water, the cat would avoid the water and then would just land on the battleship's deck. But obviously, for many reasons, that did not work out. Cats would end up passing out midair before sinking without a trace. They also tried something similar with bats, which again, didn't really work. Moving on to number four, we have the bomb shelter. This is going to come to a shock to anyone who lives outside of the US. Posted on Reddit by the user Deadpool8988, they said that at one point, the US government was telling people to build a bomb shelter in their backyards. They instructed people to dig a big enough hole in their backyard and then cover it with a door. They were told to hide out there in case of a nuclear attack. But turns out, that the real reason why they were telling families to do this was so that if there was a nuclear attack, the government wouldn't have to bury as many bodies. So families were literally digging their own graves. That is extremely disturbing. In our third spot, we have the blood supply. Okay, this one is going to be pretty crazy. So back in 1984, the Red Cross Society in Canada was importing blood products from the US. This was at the time of the AIDS crisis, and America was hit much harder with it. There was fear that the disease was going to be transmitted through this blood. But the Red Cross ignored it, and according to this Reddit user who was a lab worker for the American Red Cross, apparently they were aware of this and so was the US government. But they didn't warn Canadians. Instead, they told them they had nothing to worry about and that they tested the blood before sending it. The guy was forced to keep his mouth shut and lie. As a result, tons of hemophiliacs who had blood transfusions later died of AIDS. What's freaky? is that the reddit user that shared this information later deleted his account. I just hope that he's safe and that the government didn't come for him for exposing them. In our second spot, we have the leaked emails. In March 2016, the personal Gmail account of John Podesta, a former White House Chief of Staff and Chair of Hillary Clinton's 2016 US presidential campaign, was hacked. And his emails revealed some very disturbing things. So the emails were posted to Reddit along with other websites, and then users started to decipher them. They believe that Hillary and other people of power are part of a human and a sex ring. In the emails, they use code words like pizza, cheese pizza, and hot dogs. Kinda weird. And it would say things like, and I quote, I'm dreaming about your hot dog stand in Hawaii. Clearly, there's a hidden message to that. I can't dive into too much detail about it for obvious reasons, but you should do some research of your own. It's crazy. What makes this more suspicious is that the government removed all posts about this from Reddit, Facebook, Twitter, and other social media sites. Any posts about the emails and the theories will be removed. And in our number one spot, we have the blue van. 
Okay, this one thoroughly creeps me out. Like it just proves that the government is up to no good. So this story was posted on Reddit by a former homicide detective. One time he was called to a scene where the victim had called 911 saying that someone was trying to kill him. He told police that he was hiding in his panic room. When they arrived at his house, there were no signs of forced entry and all the doors remained locked from the inside. Inside the house there was no damage, it was just super clean, no signs of violence or anything. Due to this, the detective believed that the attacker was someone that the man knew and invited inside. When they eventually got to the panic room, they found the man sitting on the floor. His face had a terrified expression plastered on it. Both of his arms were missing, not cut off. They looked as if they had been ripped off. His missing limbs were never found. Now, here's where it gets spooky. As soon as they reported their findings, the police captain told the team to give all of the evidence, along with the victim's body, to the individuals in a blue van that had arrived on the scene. The blue van belonged to the government. After they did this, the case was buried. They never heard any more information on it. Like what? Seems like some government creature got released and killed this guy or something like that and then they're trying to cover it up. Starting off in our number 10 spot we have interception. To start off this list today let's talk about one of the very first electronic interceptions because to be honest this was happening sooner than I would have thought but in a very different way than what we are used to now. Let's set the stage and take it back to the beginning of the 1900s, the first year of the new century. We are in the midst of the Boer War which lasted from 1899 until 19. Prior to this war, the British Royal Navy had installed wireless sets that had been produced by Marconi onto their ships. This allowed the British Army to be able to use some limited wireless signaling and communication. During the war, however, nearing the end, things took a bit of a turn. While the British had captured and were holding cities and towns, there were still many dispersed Boer commandos who were out there and were taking to different tactics. They began a guerrilla war, and part of that was by intercepting telegraph messages. Messages. Not only did they intercept important messages, but they were even able to capture some of the sets to be able to use them themselves. In our ninth spot, we have Operation Big Itch. Operation Big Itch was the name given to a number of tests conducted at Dugway Proving Grounds in 1954. The experiments involved testing biological warfare on unexpected fleas. At least this time they used fleas and not real people. So the fleas were loaded into two types of munitions and then dropped from the air. After a bunch of trial and error, the operation was a success. Not only could the fleas survive the drop, but they also could still attach themselves onto the hosts, which were guinea pigs. These tests were done to see if it was possible to use infected fleas and drop them into an area to make people sick. That's not all though. In a project known as Operation Big Buzz, they decided to use mosquitoes. In May of 1955, over 300,000 uninfected mosquitoes were dropped over parts of the US state of Georgia. If it worked, they were going to infect these mosquitoes with yellow fever. These two are just some of the entomological warfare tests done in history. In our eighth spot, we have the Edgewood Arsenal drug experiments. Beginning in the 1950s, the army decided to run some tests on psychoactive drugs and other chemical agents on soldiers. About 7,000 soldiers took place in these experiments and they were exposed to 250 different chemicals. Some of the chemicals that were tested on them were sarin gas, LSD, PCP, cannabinoids, irritants, and riot control agents. The effects these chemicals and drugs had on the soldiers were studied and noted. In 1975, the tests were canceled after being deemed controversial. In the end, most of the test subjects suffered from psychological trauma and serious health problems problems. In our seventh spot, we have the plutonium experiments. Over the years, the US government has participated in a number of plutonium experiments. One of them involved a man named Albert Stevens. This man was misdiagnosed with stomach cancer and then was told he was going to receive treatment for this cancer. Meanwhile, he was just a test subject. He was injected with plutonium without even knowing. And then they said he was cured. He was led to believe that the treatment had cured him. In fact, he received the highest known accumulated radiation dose ever recorded. It should have been lethal. In the end, the plutonium remained present in his body for the remainder of his life, slowly decaying over the years. He ended up dying 20 years later from heart disease. And his ashes were actually stolen so that they could continue analyzing the radioactivity of this man. But they did this without the consent of his relatives. In our sixth spot, we have the burn victims. 
In the 1950s, researchers at the Medical College of Virginia performed a number of unethical experiments on burn victims. In particular, they targeted poor black victims. These victims did not give their consent for these tests. They were then subjected to additional burning, experimental antibiotics, and injections of radioactive isotopes. Over a 10-year period, more than 770 patients were experimented on. 460 of them were African American. A number of people developed fluid loss and anemia from the severe burns that they were subjected to. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the chemicals. From 1950 to 1953, the U.S. Army conducted a number of experiments over six cities in the U.S. and Canada. The tests were to see the dispersal patterns of chemical weapons. So they sprayed chemicals all over these cities. Some of the chemicals being zinc cadmium sulfide, which was thought to not be harmful. One place affected by these sprays was Minnipeg, Manitoba in Canada. They were informed that they were testing a chemical fog to protect Winnipeg in the event of a Russian attack. So they said that this fog was going to be a defense study, which was a lie. Although it was said to be a small dose that they were exposed to, in some urban environments, people were exposed to higher levels. And because of how small the size of the particles were, it made it more dangerous according to a scientist, due to the fact that they could get lodged deeper into people's respiratory systems. Thankfully, no one died from the tests, but it's so sketchy how they lied about it all. Like, yeah, we're doing these tests to protect you. Just kidding. In our fourth spot, we have the Holmesburg program. From 1951 to 1974, a number of dermatological experiments took place in Holmesburg Prison in Pennsylvania. The studies were performed by Dr. Albert M. Kligman on behalf of the U.S. Army, Dow Chemical Company, and Johnson & Johnson. The test started with looking at health effects of dioxin and other herbicides on the human body. So they exposed some patients to these chemicals. And years later, a number of them developed a variety of health problems like lupus. So they actually sued the professor, but that didn't stop him from continuing on with these experiments. In fact, he increased the amount of dioxin that the people were exposed to. He applied 7,500 milligrams of dioxin. That's 468 times the dosage of the first test, which still made people ill. The prisoners developed a number of terrible inflammatory pustules and papules. That's not all though. In 1967, the US Army paid Kligman to apply skin blistering chemicals to the faces and backs of inmates so they could learn how the skin protects itself from toxic chemicals in case of attack. One creepy report from Kligman said, and I quote, all I saw before me were acres of skin. It was like a farmer seeing a fertile field for the first time. That's disgusting. In our third spot, we have the FP45 Liberator, which was anything but liberating. This was a failed weapon that was going to be used by the US military during World War I. Since it was small, it could be made cheaper and more of them could be produced. The plan was to have these weapons airdrop to the soldiers. They then were gonna use these weapons to kill enemy troops before stealing their weapons. Plus they thought that enemies would be intimidated when they see all these weapons being airdropped to them. They wanted to strike fear into them. The US produced one million of these weapons, but it was all for nothing. The whole thing was found impractical and ineffective and a waste of time and money. In our second spot, we have the Dorset experiments. Between 1953 to 1975, a series of experiments were done to see how far one ship or aircraft could spread a biological warfare agent over the UK. These experiments were referred to as the Dorset Biological Warfare Experiments. Between 1961 to 1968, more than a million people along the south coast of England were exposed to E. coli and Bacillus globigii. It was spread by a military ship anchored off of the Dorset coast, spraying the organisms towards them. That was just one experiment out of many. Another one included releasing a bacteria in the London underground at lunchtime to see how far it would spread. In fact, people close to where the trials took place became very sick. Women miscarried, other kids were born with cerebral palsy or had birth defects. They blame these experiments. And in our number one spot today, we have the irradiation experiments. Between 1960 to 1971, the Department of Defense funded a number of radiation experiments. These experiments, again, were conducted without the person's consent and was mainly performed on poor and black patients with cancer. The patients were told that they were receiving a treatment that might cure their cancer, 
which was a lie. Instead, researchers were seeing the effects that high levels of radiation would have on the human body. Imagine thinking that these doctors were here to help you, but in the end, you were just one big test subject for them. And they weren't helping you. In the end, it made patients worse.